Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Patent Research, a year in review and a look ahead. I am Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at Reed Tech, and I want to cover a couple of things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the conference by using the chat or Q&A feature. We will be sending you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording from today's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Mike Huddleston. Mike Huddleston is the Director of IP Product Planning at LexisNexis IP Solution. He holds bachelor and master's degrees from Indiana University and a JD degree from the University of California. He practiced law before joining LexisNexis and has spoken at various conferences and authored articles about IP. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Gail. And uh, let me also add my thanks to everybody for uh, joining today's presentation. Um, today we're going to take a look back in time more than just the past year, really back uh, beyond that. A lot of the patent offices haven't uh, released final statistics uh, for 2017. Um, uh, but I want to take you through some global uh, filing trends for patents, what's going on in patent activity. Um, look at a uh, handful of countries in depth that are uh, kind of at the top of that volume list. Um, compare some of the technologies across countries, what's going on there. Um, and we'll also give you a, a visual view in that I think uh, you'll find interesting that, that will show you what's going on uh, in, in the patent filing community. And then uh, talk some about research providers that uh, in, in light of uh, what I've covered, what, um, uh, where are we, uh, and a look ahead to where things uh, might very well be going in the near future. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is from 2015. Um, as I said, um, depending upon where you look, uh, I did a lot of legwork in, in putting the information together for the webinar. Uh, you can find some offices that have information from 2016, um, uh, 2017 full figures, um, were hard to come by, uh, but I found some interesting things, trend lines over about the last 15 years. Um, this particular slide uh, uh, I found interesting because this is looking at uh, top 10 offices, 2015 filing volumes, and you will see here uh, that China uh, is basically equivalent to the next several offices combined. Uh, China in 2015 um, uh, topped 1 million uh, applications uh, to uh, the Chinese Patent Office uh, for the first time in history. Um, I don't see any signs of that, of that slowing down. Uh, we'll talk about some of the impacts of that and, uh, uh, and the implications of that going forward. Uh, but you'll see that there, uh, U.S. number two, Japan number three, uh, Korea, the EPO, Germany, India, uh, Russia, Canada, and Brazil make up the tail there. Um, but as you can see, uh, an overwhelming number from, uh, from China, and of those, uh, roughly 80% uh, or more of those are internal uh, inside China. So the filers are domestic filers, um, which is interesting. They're very, um, very much uh, the statistics from China show that it's all being generated uh, by inside filers, which is different from the U.S., uh, and it is at the far end of the spectrum on one end. Um, we'll see some of that uh, information um, illustrated further uh, in the U.S. as we go through this. Uh, we'll start with the U.S., and like I said, we're going to take a look at, a, at about a 15-year uh, trend line here, uh, U.S. profile. And uh, if we look at this, you can see uh, over time, and you can see on the bar graph on the right-hand side of this, is plotted out, uh, resident versus non-resident, and then abroad, U.S. filers abroad. Um, so uh, the U.S. is uh, somewhat unique among the top patent filing countries in that we, uh, as uh, a total percentage of applications in uh, the last year that I had full numbers for that I looked at, um, you see here uh, uh, 2016, 
uh, we have more foreign filers into the USPTO than domestic. Uh, for 2016, you see 295 and change versus 310 and change. Uh, most countries, um, uh, they, uh, the majority is internal domestic filers. The U.S., uh, it's an attractive market. Uh, you've probably heard, I'm sure, uh, many times talk about the export-import imbalance, and we're a net uh, importer uh, by far. We have a large trade deficit. Um, that's, uh, you, you see some of that reflected. That's consistent with what you're seeing in the patent statistics, where uh, there are more foreign filers than there are domestic filers uh, in the U.S. in terms of volume. Uh, you'll also see a red arrow here. And the red arrow here is to point uh, and you see this, it's interesting, you're going to see this as we go across uh, additional countries as well. Um, you'll see in some of them a dip right about this timeline, some of them not, some of it will be internal versus uh, foreign. And what this roughly correlates with is when we had the recession, uh, the financial meltdown and so forth that uh, I'm sure we all remember, uh, you see a dip here between, uh, you, you see basically climbing numbers from 2002 on, and then from 2008 to 2009, you see a dip in resident filings. You don't see the same dip in non-resident filing, uh, however, so that shows you uh, that there was more of an impact uh, domestically uh, due to the recession uh, when it came to patent filing uh, than there was for uh, foreign filers. I don't have the granular statistics on, uh, uh, on the foreign filers broken out by country, but my guess is here, uh, based upon a number of statistics that I've looked at, that, the, um, uh, that a number of the Asian countries kept, kept the number up for non-resident filings in spite of uh, the recession that affected more than the U.S., but certainly uh, had an effect on the U.S. Um, definitely, uh, in that time interval there, uh, a, a bit of a pullback in terms of a completely upward trajectory, uh, to having a blip on it uh, as people retrench during the recession. So that's what the red arrow there uh, uh, illustrates uh, for the U.S. If we move on and take a look at uh, the U.S. profile from, from a different metric, uh, and that is the top 10 fields uh, in terms of technology fields uh, that patents are in in the U.S. across uh, that 15-year, roughly 15-year time frame of 2002 to 2016. So you'll see here um, U.S. big computer technology, medical technology, pharmaceuticals, digital communications, um, uh, and on down the line here. Um, not surprisingly, what this correlates to, and we've all heard talk over the past several years of how uh, the U.S. has become more and more of a knowledge economy, a service economy, uh, uh, less in the way of manufacturing. You look at the technologies that are at the top of this, uh, and that reflects that some. There's, there's uh, not, not as much here when it comes to what you traditionally think of as uh, you know, heavy machinery type technology so much here. Um, uh, you do see here electrical machinery, apparatus, energy. Um, one of the other things that you're starting to see, uh, again, starting from a small base, um, uh, but uh, patenting activity, there's interesting patenting activity going on in uh, what's often referred to as clean tech, alternative energy or alternative fuels and so forth in the same way that if you would have looked back say, 20-some years ago, um, you were starting to see a uh, small but growing sector in nanotechnology uh, that's now much larger. Um, so this kind of gives you the overview of what the U.S. profile looks like for patent activity uh, in terms of both the areas of technology uh, and uh, the volume of filing over years. Um, still going back up. Uh, now, after that blip that we had, uh, if we go back to this for a second, uh, you'll see here that our numbers have picked back up, uh, going up uh, relatively steady, not sharp increases here, 
um, same over here, but an upward trend line. Okay. And going on uh, from the U.S., let's next take a look at Japan. Uh, and you'll see the findings here from Japan. And this tells an interesting story, I think, with Japan. You actually see, instead of, uh, if we look at the bar graph to the right, um, we see a trend line down instead of a trend line up. Uh, and if we look at the numbers here, resident versus non-resident, you can see very different profile than when we uh, look back at the U.S. Uh, here, um, where it's much more closer to equal or, or tips over to the point where you have more non-resident uh, than you do resident here. If we take a look at Japan, um, very heavily weighted towards resident companies filing in Japan. Uh, as opposed to foreign entities filing in Japan. Um, you do look at the same uh, red line here. You'll see, uh, and in that exact same uh, time frame, uh, where the recession had an effect here, uh, filings in both uh, resident filings and non-resident filings, there was a dip in Japan uh, during the recession period here. We look over here at our trend line and we see start to see trend line going down here with resident filings. Non-resident filings are, are, are very much a minority of their filings. Those are relatively static here. But notice as you see the resident filings going down, we're seeing the abroad filings going up. So we're seeing filings in other countries uh, going up on a trend line here uh, to where if this continues in the next few years, uh, you will get to a point where their resident filings and their abroad filings will be roughly equal. Um, speaks to, I think, some of the demographic uh, changes that have been happening uh, in Japan uh, that um, did not start yesterday that have been going on for some time uh, and, and could, uh, could be going on into the future. Um, so interesting profile for Japan, very different from the profile from, from the U.S., uh, when you look at the, the trend line uh, on a slow glide down, the abroad's going up and did have the same dip during the recession, but much more heavily weighted towards resident filings versus non-resident filings. Now let's take a look at what the uh, technology field profile looks like for Japan. And if we take a look at that, different from the U.S. in terms of the rankings, electrical machinery, apparatus, energy, which was also shared by the U.S. We'll have a comparative chart further on in the presentation where we'll take a look at that. Uh, but you'll also see some things in here that don't even show up in the top 10 in the U.S. Optics, for example, uh, audiovisual technology, furniture, games, textiles, paper machines. Um, so a different, a different profile here in Japan uh, than you see in the U.S. And one thing you will see, and you'll see this across um, all of the countries that we're taking a look at here is you see the part of the chart here that is, uh, in this case, for Japan, it's 45%. I think for the, uh, for the U.S. It was 46%. All of the countries were roughly in the, uh, in the 40%, close to 50% of others. So their top 10 roughly made up about half of their filings, their top 10 fields of technology, uh, and then the other half were scattered from 11 on down the long tail. Um, so we do see some overlap here uh, with what we see in the U.S., but again, uh, a couple of their uh, uh, more highly ranked ones, optics, audiovisual te uh, technology, uh, not showing up in the top 10 in the U.S. at all. Now let's take a look at China. Uh, and as we saw from uh, one of the early slides, um, the Chinese Patent Office has been literally deluged with applications. This is interesting. It's someone I've been working in the IP field at, at Lexis for a uh, little over 20 years. And what's interesting, uh, and you see it here, uh, uh, illustrated very well in the numbers, it used to be that um, China didn't seem to care a whole lot about uh, IP in terms of 
having a robust number of filings, uh, you would um, you would hear a lot of stories about uh, controversies between China and other countries when it came to trade secrets, uh, technology breaches, so on and so forth. But uh, what you see now is China's numbers going up rapidly as they have really bought into IP protection as you have seen their economy um, uh, grow and transform um, over the past uh, you know, decade or two. And that's really reflected in the numbers. If you look here, uh, say where we start at uh, 2002, um, just under 40,000 resident applications. And 15 years later, uh, we're at 1.2 million. Um, so a tremendous spike over time in filings to the Chinese Patent Office. Uh, we have seen growth uh, in the non-resident filings, uh, but uh, the growth in the resident filings has been so dramatic and so large that it's really swamping uh, the growth in uh, non-resident uh, in terms of when you look at it from a percentage breakdown, uh, your 1.2 million versus your 133,000 here for 2016, still roughly you know close to 90% of the filings are coming from uh, are coming from residents as opposed to non-residents. It will be interesting over time to see how that might change. Um, I think you will continue to see non-resident filings come up as as the economy continues to grow in China and it becomes more and more of a viable market for non-Chinese uh, entities uh, to the degree that they can navigate the, the, the business rules and systems over there. Um, I think you will see this grow, uh, but you may, my guess is that you'll still see a very wide gulf when it comes to a uh, percentage view or comparison between resident and non-resident. Uh, both are growing. Um, uh, but the, the resident is growing much faster, and I don't think that's going to stop uh, anytime soon. Uh, you will also see here, interestingly, during the period of uh, that, that year interval with the recession, it did not affect the growth. You see the growth going up of residents, but it did of non-residents. So what that tells you is uh, countries uh, or companies, uh, most likely, again, I, I haven't broken it down to this granular a level, but uh, in the same way that companies, uh, the statistics tell us we're pulling back in the U.S. and the resident filings actually uh, declined, you see the non-resident filings declining here. My guess is that was a fair amount of patenting activity done by U.S. companies uh, that were put on hold during that time frame as they retrenched during the recession. Um, uh, so, uh, but but the uh, but the domestic just continued going up, up, up. So, and you see that here, the, uh, uh, the growth is just tremendous here. And as again, as we said, the spread uh, goes from, in fact, if we look at 2002, actually there were more slightly, but a few hundred more non-resident filings over resident filings. And that has completely flipped to where we are today where the resident filings by far, like I said, about, are now about 90% of the filings. Uh, you'll also see that the, um, the abroad filings coming out of resident companies in China is still, while there has been growth in that, and you see that going from 1,600 to 52,000, uh, it's absolutely solid growth, but it's being dwarfed by what's going on inside the country. Now, if we take a look at uh, the profile of China from a technology perspective and their fields of technology uh, within patenting, um, you'll see here, again, uh, roughly uh, almost half of it uh, is outside the top 10. But of the top 10 here, we see um, a fair amount of commonality, actually, with the U.S. Uh, the, the rankings within the top 10 are flipped some, uh, but you see a number uh, that are uh, – that are uh, in, in both countries, computer technology, digital communication, measurement, pharmaceuticals. Um, you do see some here that are different, machine or materials and metallurgy, um, uh, food chemistry, uh, basic materials chemistry, machine tools. Uh, I think this speaks to um, where uh, China is on the curve 
uh, relative to the U.S. in terms of uh, the transitioning of the economy. Um, and there's still um, a lot of manufacturing going on uh, in China, obviously, and uh, some of these fields reflect that within here. So um, that's kind of a, an overview of China. Uh, let's take a look now at Korea, and here we're, uh, we're speaking of uh, South Korea. Uh, uh, North Korea does have some patenting activity, but it's, but it's extremely de minimis. Uh, but if we look at South Korea here, um, again, interestingly, uh, like China, there was a dip in the non-resident filings during the recession. You can see that right here. Um, basically flat uh, from a resident perspective, uh, filings within there. And if we look at our chart, Korea is on a path upward, continuing, a little bit of a dip, and then uh, back up again. Um, and again, a majority of those, uh, like all the countries except the U.S., are uh, resident, uh, the over 50% resident. And you see here, um, basically about a uh, little over three, three and a half times resident to non-resident when it comes to the filing, where we are today. Um, not as much as uh, the spread that we have uh, in China, uh, but still a healthy spread. Uh, uh, a clear majority uh, resident filings within here. Okay, um, you'll see the uh, interestingly here the filings uh, abroad um, outstrip the non-resident filings coming in, uh, and the filings abroad. I, I can tell you that that uh, Korean companies uh, are uh, there are several Korean companies that are large volume uh, filers. Uh, into the U.S., so that's um, uh, that's part of what you were seeing there um, from that. Um, so uh, that's a, a look uh, across resident, non-resident, abroad for uh, for Korea. Still, as we see, a healthy spread there, uh, as we talked about, uh, going up a little bit of a dip, but continuing to go up a little bit of a dip uh, here. Um, but I expect there's probably going to be um, continuing strong growth coming out of uh, Korea uh, going forward. Take a look at Korea uh, profile. Um, not surprisingly to me, the, knowing some Korean products, uh, semiconductors being at the top, it's not overly surprising. Um, computer technology being high up in there. Uh, they do share um, audiovisual technology with Japan as being uh, one of their uh, one of their top, uh, not only the top ten, but, their, but uh, in their top five, uh, digital communication, telecommunications, uh, optics, uh, just like we saw in Japan, transport. Uh, only country has civil engineering and other consumer goods within there as part of uh, as part of their top ten. So a fair amount of commonality here, but a few unique ones relative to other countries. Uh, you'll see the rankings are a little bit different. Uh, relative to uh, Japan and uh, China. So while uh, a lot of times monolithically we hear CJK, CJK, that's all the growth is in CJK. Um, there is a tremendous amount of growth across CJK. Uh, however, um, the growth, the, there are some fine distinctions in where the growth is happening, uh, the sectors of the economy that the growth is happening, and what's driving that across the three main players there, China, Japan, uh, in South Korea, um, and we see that reflected in both the fields of technology um, and the trend lines of the filing uh, within there. So that's a little overview of uh, Korea. Now let's take a look, uh, coming up behind that, and the only country outside the U.S. Uh, and the Asian countries that was uh, kind of in the uh, Top sector of most of the statistics I looked at, um, the clear leader uh, within Europe uh, is Germany. And we take a look at Germany here. Um, some interesting things here. Uh, if you look at the bar graph to the right, you see by far um, abroad filings are leading 
the way with Germany as opposed to uh, resident filings uh, in the country, uh, which is interesting. You do see uh, kind of the same um, overwhelming majority of the countries with, or, or the, of the, the filings within the country uh, coming from uh, domestic filers. You see in uh, 2016, uh, 73,000 plus uh, domestic, just under 20,000 uh, non resident. Um, so that trend line is very uh, similar to what we see with the Asian countries, again, the U.S. being the outlier there. Um, uh, so, um, and we do see, uh, I didn't put the red arrow here because it, it wasn't a jump out as much. There was a slight decline, uh, 28, uh, 20, 2008, 2009, uh, both from a resident uh, and a non-resident uh, perspective. Um, the volumes, uh, much lower. The overall volumes for Germany are much lower, um, but you see you see a little bit of that there. Um, overall, you see uh, relatively uh, certainly when you look at the numbers, uh, the resident filings, and when you follow that along the graph, it's relatively static, up a little, down a little, but relatively static across a 15-year time range there. But what you do see is, uh, other than a uh, slight dip, um, you do see a relatively straight line uh, going up uh, when it comes to filings abroad. Uh, the non-resident filings are uh, still fairly small, uh, up over time, uh, uh, basically doubled over the 15 years, but starting from a relatively low base. Um, so it still makes up a relatively small uh, proportion of the filings in Germany. Okay. One thing that I found interesting in Germany if uh, we go on to take a look at our next slide, is the fields of technology. Um, the fields of technology here were uh, different. Uh, some were, some were um, uh, found in the other countries, but there was a handful here that were not found in the other countries, such as engine, pumps, tur uh, turbine, and seeing where they ranked within here transport at the top, electrical machinery, uh, mechanical elements, engines, pumps, turbines. I've seen all of those in the top five. Uh, to me, that kind of shows you the profile. And if you think, um, there are a lot of well-known uh, German companies in the manufacturing sector, in machinery, uh, and so forth. So it's not totally surprising that you would see this type of uh, profile uh, coming out of there. Um, uh, you see a, a, a good number of them in those areas. Trans, uh, basically, uh, all of the top five, plus you've got machine tools. Um, uh, you do see uh, both organic fine chemistry and basic, basic materials chemistry, uh, medical technology. Not, not, uh, not totally surprised there. Um, on pharmaceuticals there as well. Um, Germany is a player in this, but you can see that their economy is not as skewed as a number of the other countries we've looked at when it comes to uh, things like telecommunications, uh, semiconductors, uh, computer, computer technology um, uh, being much more near the top in a lot of the other uh, countries. Uh, in Germany, uh, we're looking much more at a profile that is uh, more mechanical machinery uh, and then a few related to pharma uh, and medical uh, within there. So if we go on to this slide, this is where we look at the global technology comparison. And basically what I did was take all of the fields of technology uh, and plot those in a graph across the five countries we looked at, because this enables you to look at it visually in one graph, and you can see across the five countries at the same time. So you can see where you have uh, commonalities. For example, you can see that <clears throat> for four of the five companies, countries, uh, other than Germany, computer technology is in the top five, <clears throat> excuse me, is in the top five for all of those countries. U.S., Japan, China, Korea. Um, uh, you'll see uh, digital communication is in the top five uh, for three of them. Uh, you'll see uh, electrical machinery. Uh, apparatus, energy, it wasn't more uh, granularly broken out than, than that, 
Um, but uh, my guess is you're starting, as I said, to see more patent activity in alternative energy sources and methods uh, and technology uh, within there would be my guess of what's starting to drive some of that and why you're seeing it across uh, multiple uh, countries because you're all seeing countries that are um, countries that if you look relatively on a global scale at where countries are on the curve when it comes to industrialization or post-industrialization, um, uh, I, I would say um, four out of the five are in the post-industrialization stage. China is rapidly getting uh, working towards getting to that point. Um, so you're, you're seeing a lot of stuff that's more um, in the technology as opposed to the machinery end of things. And even though um, Germany, I, I would say, is in the post-industrial phase in terms of, of where it is in the country, its economy, its technology, and so forth, um, it still is a leader in some of those heavier um, uh, machine uh, technology and mechanical technologies. Um, and then you'll see here, um, uh, you know, you'll have some uh, outliers uh, by particular countries. For example, uh, Japan is the only one that uh, has textiles in the top 10. Uh, that's number 10 for it. Um, uh, uh, consumer goods is number 10 for Korea. It's the only one that that's uh, in the top 10 for. So uh, it, it's an interesting array of technologies across the main players uh, in terms of patenting volume uh, in the world. So not that these are the only players. Um, there are statistics uh, that you can get for a lot of other countries as well. I think over time, uh, as, as it progresses along that curve I was talking about, you're going to see uh, more uh, filings, uh, filing volume, and um, uh, interesting mix of technology areas uh, coming out of India, for example. Um, so. Uh, It'll be interesting to see over time. So that's our global technology comparison. Um, I did want to show one thing here that I am going to flip over to uh, another application uh, to show this. I wasn't able to embed this in the PowerPoint slide, but this is a little video that we'll watch for just a minute. And it basically, uh, what I've gone over here in terms of the t statistics gives you this in a visual, interactive way uh, on a map of the world. So let's take a look at this. And we're going to start this over. So watch from 1990 going forward. There's the explosion. You see that it's China. It dwarfs the rest of the world. So that's just a little uh, video that I thought did a good job of uh, uh, visually and in, in, in an interactive way showing uh, what exactly has been happening in the world. Um, so a uh, little summary of the points we've covered up to this point. The filings continue to go up worldwide. Uh, I don't see anything really. Um, that uh, I know of that's going to stop that, uh, certainly in the short term. Uh, the locus of where the increase is coming from continues to shift uh, and is shifting more uh, towards Asia. But as we saw within Asia, um, it's not an equal shift. We actually saw uh, starting to see a bit of a downward trend uh, in Japan, um, whereas an astronomical increase in China uh, which is really driving that in, uh, the, the overall Asian increase. Um, and also um, uh, an increase in Korea, uh, but nowhere near as along the lines of what's going on in China. Uh, we saw the technology fields differ by geography, but that there are several commonalities. Basically, the U.S. and the Asian countries 
Um, all are heavy into telecommunications, semiconductors, computer technology. Uh, again, that knowledge service-based uh, economy. Um, uh, Germany's a little more heavy, uh, heavier still into uh, electrical machinery uh, and so forth. We saw some of that in China as well, metallurgy um, uh, and materials. Um, so uh, I think over time, what you're going to see is those trend lines will probably remain. Um, those will remain uh, consistent. Um, I don't think you're going to see huge technology shifts uh, in terms of patenting activity there. Um, I do think that you will, over time, see other players coming on to see more. I, I mentioned India. I think that's one. There may very well be others. Um, so it's, uh, these are interesting times in the patent world. Certainly uh, interesting uh, as someone who works at a provider of solutions for patent researchers uh, like yourself. So let's uh, transition and talk a little bit about that. Um, free versus fee, what are the implications? Uh, there are several sites out there, where, whether it be the USB, USBTO, the FOSNET, uh, WIPO, uh, where you can get information uh, for free from patent offices, um, different information, different technology on each site. Um, uh, from a from a fee-based perspective, companies like our own, LexisNexis IP Solutions, uh, the former uh, Thompson, now Clarivate, uh, Questel, so on and so forth. I, I think the implication for us as companies is that, uh, and this is, I think, um, all to the benefit of you as researchers, is um, it's a constant spur for us to innovate, invest, and add value. Uh, because if we're not doing that, um, then there's no reason for somebody to pay one of us versus getting a certain amount of technology, uh, uh, features, uh, content uh, for free from a patent office site. So uh, it's a spur to all of us to continue to innovate in this space ourselves. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're specifically what we're doing because I can talk to that. Um, can't talk so much to the inner workings of the others, obviously. Um, what we've been hearing from the market. Um, so we do a lot of surveying of our customers. Uh, we have NPS surveys. We have a customer advisory board. Um, we uh, have um, a customers, uh, customer training group. Um, we collate and, and digest a lot of feedback from our customers, as well as talking to customers uh, at trade shows, uh, et cetera. And one, I, I can just share a few of the things that uh, I think we've consistently heard uh, from our customers, and that is the need for, as, as you saw, the number of filings growing, growing, growing. Um, there's more and more uh, technology and uh, advances in data technology, storage technology, uh, and so forth have done a couple interesting things in this area. Uh, one. It's lowered the barrier to entry. There are more players than there, than there have ever been. Although in my 20 plus years, I've seen kind of an accordion effect where there'll be a lot of new entrants and then people will get acquired and it kind of, it goes, it expands and there'll be a lot of little niche players and then it contracts and some of those niche players either exit out of uh, the vertical or are acquired by bigger players. Um, uh, that's one effect of the advances in technology. The other effect is there's simply more and more data available to be searched that could be potential prior art than there has ever been before. Um, this presents both opportunities and challenges. I think from your side of the fence as researchers, it presents a huge challenge in the sense that um, the it, you, I guess the way I would put it would be it used to be there was a relatively well-defined uh, universe of what was accessible and so what could actually be uncovered as potential prior art. If you think back to the days before, uh, and it wasn't all that long ago uh, in, the, in the larger scope of things, uh, back to the days before there were um, digitized patents online that could be searched, um, you basically hire a search firm or you go to the USPTO and you'd search through the shoes. Um, 
there was there was only so far that search could extend because technology had not made a lot of it available. Um, but today, uh, that's changed uh, very rapidly, and I'm going to talk in a minute uh, when I talk about some of the things we're doing about how that's poised to ex expand even more rapidly. Um, there's just more and more out there uh, to search. That presents a challenge. You don't want to miss something that's critical uh, that could come back to haunt you. Um, so the need to have uh, tools that can both have the horsepower to find things that you're looking for, as well as present you with um, as voluminous a content set to search as you can uh, become increasingly important. Um, because otherwise, the continued filing trends that we see just lead to more and more data to be searched, and it can all become white noise uh, without the proper uh, tools uh, to get at it. And that leads to uh, the other thing that we're hearing a lot from the market that I was going to say, which is a lot of customers, both customers of ours, prospects we've talked to, people I've talked to at trade show, uh, the buzzword you hear over and over and over again is analytics. I need more analytics. And what's really, when you dig a little deeper underneath that, uh, what's, what I find at least is, is the most common message for what that's driving at is, I'm swamped in data, help me make sense of it. Um, just doing a basic search and getting 35,000 documents back, I need something that helps me make sense of that. Um, I don't have the time. Uh, we, you know, we hear all the time about, it, you know, and in some sectors of the legal economy, uh, time is literally money. I used to practice, I know that. Um, uh, but we hear either I don't have the time, uh, we don't have the staff we used to have. Uh, we saw during uh, that the red arrows across a lot of those countries back in the 2008, 2009 timeframe, we, we saw a lot of downsizing. Um, we saw a lot of apart, uh, departments, whether they be uh, corporate patent departments, or whether they be law firm ones, search firms, uh, get, get very lean. Um, uh, we often hear, we need to be more efficient. Uh, we only have so many resources but the workload hasn't gone down any. Um, so what can you do to help us? Um, those are the things we've been hearing from the market. So uh, what do providers, uh, if we take a look ahead, what do providers need to do? Uh, what are we doing today? What do we need to continue to do to help you, the patent researcher? Um, we have to stay ahead of the curve in terms of providing you solutions that enable you, uh, the phrase I always use, um, is to cut to the chase. Um, need to be able to, to find what you're looking for uh, as efficiently as you can, as easily as you can, and to be able to make sense of it quickly uh, in a way that allows you to digest it and for you to also communicate it to others either laterally or vertically up the food chain, uh, up the hierarchy. Um, we're focused on doing that. Um, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about what we're doing uh, right now and what's coming uh, in the year ahead. Um, one of the things that we're doing, uh, we're actually right in the middle of doing this now, is replacing our legacy patent research platform, uh, Total Patent, uh, with a brand new platform, uh, Total Patent One. We're in the process of migrating customers over now. Um, and uh, one of the reasons that we, there were several reasons that we've done that. One, um, uh, th there were some internal corporate reasons for doing it. Uh, also, in listening to our customers consistently, the feedback we were getting was, um, you have a very broad and deep content set, uh, but the tool is, is, uh, is showing its age a bit in terms of its speed, in terms of the ease of use, um, the UI, uh, et cetera, we, we would hear feedback consistently from customers, from NPS surveys, and so forth. So we built uh, literally a brand new platform with new technology that's well beyond what uh, the legacy Total Patent platform was capable of because of the time uh, it was built and the architecture it was built on. A brand new platform utilizing Angular technology. Uh, everything is built on a single page application uh, model where everything slides in, slides out. There's not a rabbit hole you can fall down. 
Um, it's a much more streamlined UI, much less, uh, uh, much cleaner. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we've employed a new backend um, uh, search processor uh, for that. We switched from MarkLogic to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is uh, being adopted by, by more and more uh, companies. And as the name implies, Elastic, it's elastic in terms of its ability to expand and meet the needs of uh, us as a, as a um, provider of tools to you, uh, for you as a user of such tools. Um, when you look at what people are searching on our platform um, uh, that is powered by the content repository uh, that we have in the background, we are um, the world's largest fabricator of patent data. We have 117 million documents uh, and counting, goes up every week, um, coming from over 100 different authorities. Um, so, uh, and doing constant daily updates, whether it be legal status, assignment changes, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it's a huge operation. Um, uh, so, um, what are we doing uh, from that perspective in light of what you saw uh, earlier in the statistics? I'll share a couple interesting things that we're doing. Um, as I said, we have the new platform, but when it comes from a, from a content perspective, um, one of the things we've been hearing is the need to have a truly global platform and truly global content. Uh, so what we're doing there is we've already, the new platform uh, is already capable of being used in English, Chinese, Korean, or Japanese. There's a preference switch, you choose your language and the entire UI will be in that language. Um, you can search in any of those languages uh, as well, uh, as well as uh, the other languages that we have from, from the various databases. I mentioned that we had, um, uh, or actually, I, I mentioned that we had um, content from over 100 different authorities. We've translated, we've done machine translations on all that content into, um, into English, so you can search across the entire content set in English. What we are now starting to do and are doing over this next year is we're actually reversing that process and we are translating the Asian language content um, that is originally filed, or I'm sorry, the uh, English language content originally filed in English. So things like the US uh, database, um, Australia, uh, the UK, et cetera. And we're translating all of that from English to Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. Uh, there have been a lot of um, uh, advancements when it comes to uh, language translation and processing. Um, uh, the, one of the most interesting things, uh, and there are articles out there about this. If you, uh, uh, Google was uh, 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 recently deployed some of this last year. Um, we're doing it within our business as well, is um, what we call um, an approach to translations that's neural networks as opposed to a statistics-based approach. Uh, what we find is that translations can be done uh, faster and the accuracy uh, goes up considerably. Uh, it's interesting. It's in essence, the neural network learns from the content that you feed it. Um, and over time, as you feed more and more in, uh, there are uh, statistically significant improvements we see in the translations that we're getting out of that. So um, we're, we're evolving towards a world where um, whatever language you want to search in, you'll be able to search in. Um, we'll put the content in the, in, in the different languages. We'll put the UI in the different languages. Uh, and the other area going forward that we are um, that we're focused on this year is expanding uh, expanding our analytics capabilities. Um, uh, currently, besides uh, our research platform, you may be familiar with a couple of our other products. Uh, one is a prosecution analytics tool, Patent Advisor. Another is a patent drafting and, and document analytics tool, Patent Optimizer. Uh, but we are also looking to build more analytics into the new search platform uh, than existed in the legacy platform. And that effort will continue on. Um, um, we're uh, LexisNexis IP Solutions, which is run out of our um, Read Tech business unit, is all about IP. It's really all we do. Um, 
the, the legacy of Reed Tech is we've been um, uh, the provider of technology to the patent office in excess of 50 years, um, where the patents that you see from the USPTO, those are all put together by us under contract for the PTO. So um, we basically do um, all of that. We're an information factory, in a sense, uh, in terms of doing that. And then our Univencio business unit uh, is where our content repository for our 100-plus our, uh, um, authorities that uh, we process uh, and fabricate on a daily basis is located. Uh, and then you have the, search, or the end user tools uh, like Total Patent, Total Patent 1 uh, for that. So there's a lot more to come uh, over this next year. It's going to be a very busy year for all of us here, uh, especially me. Um, being the product director for this platform, but I'm excited for the things that we can do and the things that we can um, uh, provide to the market. So um, at this point, uh, Gail, we've got uh, roughly about 10 minutes left, so I wanted to leave a, a few minutes left if we had either uh, any questions uh, uh, as well as any um, uh, housekeeping stuff that we, uh, that we need to share with our audience. I'll turn it back to sure. you. Sure. Uh, Mike, there is one question that's come in about um, the China filings, and that is, um, does the increase in China filings evidence a new or growing confidence in China's IP protection systems as recognized by Chinese residents? Do you have any sense of that? I, yeah. I'll, I can give you my own opinion on it. I think it does, and, and here's why. We, we've seen, it, it's an interesting evolution that's gone on in China, and it will be interesting to see where it goes from here. In terms of, uh, they've been walking a fine line of maintaining um, a basically top-down, state-directed political system through communism, while simultaneously opening up their economy uh, in various, what I would call more capitalistic ways. Um, and I think that's what's driven that's what's driven the intellectual property revolution in China is there's been a complete economic revolution. And when that's happened and when the incentives are there for people to be able um, to monetize, to cash in, whatever you want to call it, uh, on what they're doing, um, intellectual property protection will naturally follow from that as people want to protect what they have developed. Um, I don't see that changing. Um, unless, unless uh, there were a huge political disruption there that cut off the dynamism that's been allowed to flourish within their economy. If that does not happen, I think this, this uh, if you want to call it a newfound respect, so to speak, for uh, intellectual property protection, um, will continue because uh, it, there's, there's market incentives, market incentives now inside China for it to continue. The, the IP protection um, uh, uh, increase there, to me, is just a natural consequence of what's happened with the, with the uh, revolution uh, in the economy in China. Thanks, Mike. That's great. Um, there are no other questions uh, except to say that a number of you have asked again about the slides, and they will be made available via email um, following this webinar. Once we have the recording available, all registered participants will receive uh, an email with a link to both these slides and uh, the recording as well. So with that, I, uh, I think we'll give you all back a few minutes in your day, and thank you again very much for attending and hope you found it useful. Thank you Thank as well. You, Mike.